Okay guys, so this lecture is going to talk about animal reproduction, um, some of the different strategies that animals use to reproduce, um, the formation of sperm um, in males, um, and how it travels around in the testes and uh, is eventually going to uh, be used to uh, fertilize the egg, um, and the formation of the egg um, and the traveling of it through the fallopian tubes and down into the uterus and things like that in the female. Um, so let's talk about this lecture. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with it. Now as you guys probably know, um, there are two main types of reproduction. Well, there's only two really, um, sexually and or asexually. Now some organisms can do both, um, but the vast majority of organisms are usually going to be one or the other kind of thing. Um, so you're probably familiar with what both of these are, but if you're not, let's go ahead and go over them very quickly. Now asexual reproduction um, is literally with what that word means. The uh, prefix a means without. Um, so without sex, so reproduction without sex. Um, these types of organisms, like these little aphids down here, um, these guys essentially just clone themselves. They make a little copy of themselves, uh, split in half, make an identical little copy. Um, they lay a little fertilized eggs um, that just instantly develop kind of thing. Um, they're genetically identical to one another. Um, all of these guys are the exact same. Now, this is a very useful strategy, a um, very quick reproductive strategy. You get a lot of numbers very quickly. You don't have to worry about having a partner. So if there's a, not a mate around, it doesn't really matter, I and mean, things like that. But there are some downsides to this. All of these guys are genetically the same. Um, if a disease is going to impact one of them, it's going to impact almost all of them. They are going to be clones, so they're all going to be genetically identical. Um, so if not all of them, um, almost all of these guys will be impacted by the same disease. Um, if if, a, 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 if a, the drought occurs or a, a particular nutrient is uh, um, removed uh, from this environment that they've evolved to eat, um, they'll probably all starve to death because they're all genetically identical. Whereas sexual reproduction, sorry, um, on the other hand, um, we'll talk about that one in just a second, is going to add a little bit of genetic variation, um, is going to increase the chances of some of these organisms to survive. Now, there's another form of asexual reproduction. Um, rather than just the uh, normal having little eggs and things like that, and they make a, a genetic copy of themselves, um, there's a, two different types uh, that are known as fragmentation or budding is another form of this. Now, if you're uh, familiar with this one with sponges, um, you can just cut off a little tiny piece of the sponge up here. Um, and essentially what will happen is if you cut off this sponge and you put it in a nice and uh, happy environment, say you cut it off right here, um, you take the little piece you cut off and you move it over here and stick it back on the same rock, um, it will essentially grow a brand new sponge from that little tiny piece. Um, so if the sponge is damaged um, and the little piece floats off in the environment, it will grow a brand new sponge. Um, so it's a very interesting form of reproduction. You grow a new form of yourself, a new version, a new organism um, from an old piece that's left over, which is pretty cool. Um, budding is another type of asexual reproduction um, where a, uh, things like yeast and stuff form a little tiny baby version of a yeast to the side that eventually grows larger and then will pop off uh, from the uh, original colony. Now, some organisms, um, this happens a lot in reptiles, there are, uh, I think it's one or two species of mammals that do this, uh, but it's mostly going to be found in reptiles, um, have a type of, um, um, excuse me, um, reproductive, asexual reproductive strategy um, called parthenogenesis. So parthenogenesis, reproduction um, without a male, which is very interesting. Now, how these things work um, is these guys, it's mostly found in lizards, these are found in the uh, United States and the Southwest. Um, what happens is there's no males in this species. Um, there are absolutely no X or no Y chromosomes present within this entire species of lizards. They're all female. Now they are born, however, with fertilized eggs inside of them. They're born pregnant. Now I'm not under, I don't fully understand the mechanisms of how that works, um, but I'm sure someone does. Um, but they are born pregnant, which is very strange. Now um, the interesting part is that at one point in time, there were males of this species. Um, there are not now, but there were. And we know that because the uh, females, even though they're all females and they're all born pregnant, they don't need a male. They still have to undergo the mating process where the male um, will uh, mount the female. Um, this triggers the release of hormones inside of the females, or, or inside of the mounted female, I should say. They're both females. 
um, that causes her already fertilized eggs to become active, um, to become uh, um, fertilized in the sense of that they're going to start development. There's a better way to put that. Triggers the development um, of those fertilized eggs into an, an embryo. Um, so they have to undergo this mating process or else those eggs will never, ever, ever develop. Um, so then this female that's mounted the female right now um, could switch and then she can be mounted and then her eggs will become fertile as well. So there once were males in this species. They have evolved away um, for some unknown reason. Um, but they once had it because they have to undergo this mating process to stimulate the hormones. Um, if they never had males, this would not exist. Um, this would not be a thing that existed inside of their species if they never had a male. Um, so very, very, very interesting um, reproductive process. Oh, I forgot to mention um, fragmentation. If you can break uh, away and grow a body part back, um, you have to uh, be able to do that for fragmentation. You have to be able to regenerate your body parts <laughs> to be able to grow um, your part back that breaks away. So sexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction requires two individuals. Um, their gametes will unite, um, forming a new zygote, a new embryo, um, that is genetically different than both of the parents. Now that's going to um, shake up genetics a little bit. So I mentioned over here with our aphids that all of these guys are genetically the same, so things like diseases and nutrient shortages and stuff will affect them um, all the same. Now over here, um, you're going to get a little bit of shakeup, um, some of the dad's genes, some of the mother's genes, um, and you're going to get an offspring that's half and half or a little bit different um, than their parents. So if a disease comes in that kills the father, um, and kills the mother, the baby might have gotten a combination of genes that makes them immune or a nutrient shortage that uh, the mother can eat, the father can't, and the baby can. Um, so there's a, 50, uh, a little more chance of survival for the baby um, than one of the parents' side. So it kind of can shake up genetics a little bit. Um, so when sexual reproduction occurs, um, the offspring are genetically different, um, which gives them a slightly um, better chance of uh, being just different enough to survive in the environment. Now, they might be too different to survive. Uh, they might not have enough fur. They might not be able to eat the same nutrients, um, but that's the shakeup, and that's the dice roll that evolution takes with that one. Everybody's going to die, or you have a one in four chance of survival over here if a disease comes in, and that's kind of the uh, um, chance that, that evolution takes over here. you got a 99.9% .9 chance of death or a 25% chance of survival. So that's kind of how evolution rolls on this one. So asexual reproduction um, occurs when the environment is stable in organisms that can do both. If you can only do asexual reproduction, that's the only form of reproduction you can do. Um, but if you can do both, some organisms can. Um, they will choose to do asexual reproduction um, when the environment is stable, when there's not a lot of diseases, when there's a lot of nutrients, a lot of uh, moisture and things available to keep these organisms happy. Um, if they are happy, their offspring that are born will be happy, and then the offspring that were born to that one will be happy, and so on and so forth. So there's no need to shake up um, your genetic variability. If you can do both, um, if the environment starts to go bad, um, you start to run out of food, you start to run out of nutrients and things like that, um, if you run out of water, a disease comes in, um, these organisms will shift from asexual reproduction to sexual reproduction. Um, and that's going to help increase the chances of their offspring having some sort of different mutation, some sort of difference um, that allows them to survive in the environment better than their parents. Um, their parents are all going to die, but the babies might have a little different, a little better chance of survival um, in that strategy. So if you can only sexually reproduce, you're only going to do that one. Um, organisms that can do both, um, asexual reproduction occurs in a stable environment. Sexual reproduction um, occurs in a chaotic, a less stable environment. And if you can only asexually reproduce, that's the only way you can reproduce. That's the only thing you're going to be able to do. So, um, in reproduction, and for most organisms that you're probably familiar with, um, reproduction is going to occur um, with the uniting of two haploid gametes. Now, um, you get one half of your genetics, that's the haploid part, um, from your dad. Um, in the form of his sperm, and the other half of your genetics is going to come from your mother. The other half of your haploid cell is going to come in the form of her egg. These two haploid cells unite um, at the process of fertilization, half from your mother um, in the egg, half from your father in the sperm, to form a 
diploid zygote. A zygote is the very first cell of a new um, forming organism. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, once this process occurs, um, this is the first cell that will develop into whatever the organism will become. So very, uh, very interesting process going from diplo haploid here, uniting the single cell, half cells, um, the half DNA from your father, half DNA from your mother, and uniting them um, to form a diploid zygote that contains all of the information that will eventually lead to the formation of another organism, another fully um, developed organism. So um, sexual reproduction. Um, can occur in two different ways. You're probably familiar with both of these as well, and they're not that difficult to understand. Internal fertilization or external fertilization. Both of these have different strategies, and they're both useful in different ways. Um, organisms that can, uh, reproduce external, external fertilization. The male um, and females will gather together into the same area, um, or sometimes if the organism can't move, this is going to be why they do this. If it's difficult, they don't have re uh, really developed gonads and things like that. Um, it's hard to mate, um, things like that for a sea urchin. They can't really climb on top of one another to unite their gonads and things like that. Um, sometimes uh, they can't move and things like that. Like a sponge, they're kind of stuck to the ground. Um, or you move very slowly, so it's kind of difficult to get to one another, things like that. So these are the types of organisms um, that often do external fertilization. Um, water is a great way to do this because you're going to be spraying your gonads, or excuse me, um, your gametes, excuse me. Um, gonads produce gametes. Um, your gametes into the environment. Um, you're going to be spraying your sperm if you're a male into the water. Or if you're a female, you're going to be spraying your eggs into the environment. So um, that's external fertilization. The sperm and eggs will unite in the environment um, and start to develop external of the organism, that the parent organism's bodies. Um, so they don't carry around the babies. Um, they're not going to be inside of anything. They're going to be uniting outside of the organism's body um, and fully developing outside of that organism's body. Um, no organism um, that reproduces externally has internal development like that. Um, so the sperm is released from the father um, out into the water or the air or something like that. Water is a really good way to use this. Air is a little more difficult. Um, then the eggs are released from the female into the water, um, and they can swim to one another. The currents carry them around and things like that. They come in contact with one another, bump, fertilize, um, and then you can form a new sea urchin or a new sponge or something that way. And then there's internal fertilization, and this is the one you're probably most familiar with because humans are internal fertilizing animals, um, as well as most of the other organisms that you are familiar with. Um, the gametes will unite inside of one of the uh, parent organisms, um, usually the female. Not always, but almost always um, it will be the female. Um, so the male will um, get close to the female's gametes, or, or her gonads, excuse me, her reproductive organs, um, his reproductive organs will sometimes penetrate. In the case of birds, they don't do that. They have a cloaca. They essentially just kind of rub their little uh, reproductive holes together kind of thing. Um, and sperm just kind of squirts between them. Um, very kind of strange reproductive system. But anyway, um, the sperm goes inside the female, um, and then the sperm will unite with the eggs inside of her. And then the initial stages of development, um, at minimum, are going to occur inside of at least uh, one of the parent organisms. So the mother will develop um, the zygote inside of her, um, and then inside of the egg, will, the eggshell will be secreted around the egg as it's developed, um, and then passed out, and she'll sit on the egg. But still, the gametes unite inside of her and develop for at least some point in time inside of the parent. Um, and that's the difference between internal and external fertilization. So once that zygote forms, um, it's going to start to split in half. This is called cellular division. Um, and the way that the cells start to divide and the way that they split um, is a very, um, a very good way to look at um, evolutionary relationships throughout history. Um, some organisms that are, are a little more simplistic, a little more um, ancient on the evolutionary path, um, will follow one route of division, um, and their cells will develop in a certain way, um, whereas another one will develop in a different way. 
Um, and that's kind of a big branching point on evolution. Um, if you're going to be classified this way, um, you're kind of a primitive organism, or if you go this way on the tree, um, you're a little more simple, uh, a little more complex organism. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a second. So the way that cells start to split apart um, is called differentiation. So what would happen if this one cell just made an exact copy of itself. You would have a non-differentiated human cell, just a human cell, that would make another human cell, that would make another human cell, um, and eventually you'd just end up with a big blob of human cells. Well, you guys know that we have different tissues inside of our bodies. We have eye tissues and things like that, liver tissues, arm tissue, um, muscle tissue, and whatnot. So all of those different types of cells need to become those different types of tissues. So they do that through the process of differentiation. Um, but to build our body, we have to build um, different structures first. And these are the first structures that are going to be differentiated. Things like your, um, your internal organ layout, your body layout, your body plan is going to be built. Um, the cells that make up your hands, your bones, and things like that, your internal organs are going to be laid down in place. Um, and that's going to occur when one cell um, divides into two that become uh, cells uh, for your stomach that eventually will become your stomach and then those two cells will divide into four cells that are going to be stomach cells and then to eight um, and then eventually they will grow into a stomach in one little area. Now these cells over here may develop into a pancreas and then they grow into the pancreas over here. I um, mean that's the differentiation process. As more cells uh, arise they will slowly differentiate out into very specialized little structures. Well, I'll become the eyeballs. Well, you become the nose. You become the ears. You become the brain um, and things like that. And this is how organisms develop. Now, this type of differentiation is also going to be a good point in the branching of evolution. If your cells are set in motion from what they're going to be from the second that they're formed, or if they're flexible, and once they're formed, they can become seven or eight, nine, ten different other types of cells, and they change over time, depending on what's needed at the moment. And that's a big branching point in evolution as well, which type of uh, di differentiation your cells take. So building the pro body of an organism, um, laying out where the arms are, laying out where the legs are, the head, and things like that, um, is called pattern formation. Um, these cells are going to differentiate in a very particular way to make sure that your arms are built in the right way, in the right shape, in the right location, um, and that your fingers are shaped the right way and that they function the right way um, through the process of differentiation. Now, development of an organism. Once you are formed um, as a zygote to the point where you are a mature um, sexually reproductive adult. Now keep in mind the entire point of evolution is to have babies. Um, so every point between their uh, of formation um, and sexual reproduction is essentially useless for evolution. You are contributing nothing really to the system. You are just mostly taking resources out. So up until the point where you're sexually reproductive, that's really the point that matters. So we're going to be talking about what happens from an organism that the second that it's formed to this point that it's uh, sexually reproductive in the form of development here. Now, you can have indirect development or direct development. An organism that uh, shows indirect development is going to be like our little caterpillar here. Now, you've probably seen eggs, caterpillar eggs. They hatch into a little caterpillar here. This little caterpillar looks nothing at all like the adult sexually active, sexually reproductive um, or version of that organism. So this organism here will have to go through some form of metamorphosis, um, change in itself, um, before it becomes a sexually reproductive organism. Um, they look nothing alike. Major drastic changes are going to have to occur. Um, you probably are familiar with these with things like a, um, caterpillars, moths, butterflies, um, lots of insects. Their larval stages look nothing like the adults and things like that. <clears throat> this is indirect development. Um, the second that it's formed in the sexually reproductive structure, they don't look anything like. Um, there's nothing in between. There's steps in between, and those steps look nothing alike. Now over here, direct development, on the other hand, the second that you're formed, 
um, that you're born, quote unquote, to the second that you become sexually reproductive as an adult, you look pretty much identical. You're just kind of a small baby version of that organism. A baby turtle looks pretty much like a big turtle. You would be able to look at these two and go, yep, they're both turtles, both tortoises. And over here, you would, if you didn't know, you would not know that these were the same species of organisms at all. They're uh, not just in different stages of their life. And over here, very easy to tell. That's direct development. We develop, uh, we are have direct development. Our cells differentiate one time. Once they're differentiated, they stay where they're differentiated and they just grow into a, a bigger version of themselves and create more of their own cells um, to make a bigger adult organism. Now, in cells that are, are organisms that have indirect development, their cells have to differentiate multiple times. They differentiate once from the egg um, to the um, intermediate caterpillar form, um, and then once again they have to differentiate through the process of metamorphosis inside of the pupa um, to form that adult. So let's go ahead and talk about how humans reproduce in the process of forming sperm um, and eggs and what's going to occur once they unite. Um, to form another uh, fully functional human. Now this is the male reproductive system. Um, you're probably familiar with this drawing. We have our testes down here. We have our um, vas deferens, the tube that the sperm travels through. Um, your prostate sits right here. Your ureters um, are down in here. Um, and then you have your um, urethra down here, um, down through the penis. So very easy here. This is the spongy, uh, bungus spongy form. Um, this floods with blood that causes an erection. So let's go ahead and talk about what's going to occur. Um, it's how sperm is produced and where it's going to travel, um, eventually leading to ejaculation um, to form a, uh, another, or eventually um, to fertilize an egg. So down here, um, you have your gonads. We've talked about these a little bit. These are the testes. Um, essentially, what's going to happen down here um, is hormones are going to be produced down here, like testosterone and things like that. Um, this is also where sperm cells are going to be produced. Now, I'm going to give you guys a very brief overview of this. Um, if you would like a little more information, check out the uh, extra um, videos that I've included as well in this course if you'd like to figure out a little more in-depth information of how this works. So, you have your diploid uh, cell. Every cell in our body starts out as diploid. Um, you have to be able to take diploid to get haploid um, through the process of meiosis to form um, your sperm cells. So this is um, a generation of our germ cells, so germ cell generation, or germ cell right here. Um, this guy is going to be diploid. It's going to form a primary spermatocyte, which is also diploid. This cell is going to split into a ha two haploid cells. It's going to travel. Uh, now this is inside the testicle, by the way. You can kind of see that right in here. There's tons of coils inside of the testicles, um, lots and lots and lots of coiled up little tubes. Now inside all these little tubes, um, there's a giant hole in the middle, it's a tube. And now on the edges of the tube is where this is occurring. You can see this here. Um, this is the tube that's uh, twisted all throughout the testicles. It's a big giant uh, yarn ball inside of there. Um, and that tube is hollow in the inside, and this is where this is going to occur on the edge of that tube. You can see that right there. So. On the very edge of the tube, um, our sperm generating cells are going to make two diploid cells. Um, one's going to split into two, or uh, sorry, two diploids. One diploid cell is going to split into two haploids. Those two haploid cells are going to split again into four haploid cells. Those four haploid cells are very primitive sperm cells. They will eventually be pushed through. Um, out through the uh, seminiferous tubercle that, that they were produced from into the hole um, through the inside of the uh, testicle. So once they enter the hole through the inside of the testicle, um, they will acquire their tails, um, they will get uh, a functional um, ATP added to them, energies added to them, um, so now they're able to swim. Now essentially a sperm is a ball of DNA um, so um, I'll come back to that if I don't have on it. Yeah, okay. So essentially a sperm is a ball of DNA um, that has to be ha in, an, in an engine. So its entire job is to swim. Um, and if your entire job is to swim, it takes a lot of energy to swim. Um, and it also takes a lot of energy to be able to swim from point A to point B. And then when you get there, you have to be able to burrow through the wall of the egg 
um, to help or to get inside. And that's going to take a lot of energy to do so. So you need a lot of ATP um, to be able to power that uh, movement um, and then that drilling in through. So essentially a sperm is a little ball of DNA, the useful reproductive part, and a ton of mitochondria all attached to a tail. It's essentially all it is. Um, you need the DNA for the reproductive part. You need a billion mitochondria to power um, this flagella right here, which allows the, the sperm to swim um, through the environment of the fallopian tubes and then eventually burrow its way through and inside of the egg cell. Um, this acrosome up here um, is essentially a little uh, hard protective cap. Um, it's kind of a, like a coating on a drill bit um, that allows it to cut a little better um, where if you just had a steel uh, uh, drill bit, you put add a little carbide tip to it, um, it's a little harder metal, um, so it allows it to penetrate through the egg cell a little better. Um, whereas if it was just a soft, squishy sperm cell, um, you, it would have to drill a little harder in. It's got this little rigid um, tip on it that allows it to drill through the uh, egg cell a little better. Let's take a step back um, and talk about this one again. So I've already talked about how this one works. You produce that primary spermatozoa here spermatocyte here that's going to split into two spermatocytes, um, into four spermatids, um, undergoing, uh, they're going, once they're here, they're going to be washed um, through these Sertoli cells. Um, these Sertoli cells are going to give them lots of nutrients, which is going to power the ATP um, and give them enough energy to be able to take that long swim through the testes out, um, and then uh, through the penis, through ejaculation, and then up the fallopian tubes. Um, so all that energy they're going to get from that Sertoli cell as they go through there. So here's a little summary of how that works. If you'd like to check that one out again, one splits into two, um, two split into four. So um, now, anyway, once the sperm um, leaves the testes um, into the little uh, tubules, it will eventually swim all the way around the little tubes here, all the tubes, and then it will eventually enter in um, to the epididymis, which uh, is, sits around the testes. Now, the sperm is going to be stored here um, until it's going to be needed, until ejaculation is going to occur. Um, and it will essentially just sit um, in the epididymis for a, a, a period of time um, until ejaculation occurs. Now, what's going to happen um, is once ejaculation is ready to occur, um, the sperm will leave the epididymis travel through the vas deferens here, which is a long tube, up through here. Um, underneath the urinary bladders, which sits right here, your prostate sits underneath it, which is super fun. Um, and it's going to travel through the uh, um, ejaculatory duct, which is going to give the sperm um, a little extra um, uh, juice to. So the seminal vesicle here. Um, is going to, so prior to, while the sperm's swimming up the vas deferens, I forgot to, I should mention, um, there's not a lot of fluids. It's just kind of swimming around in, in a, a little, like, kind of a water solution. Once it reaches the seminal vesicle, um, it's going to have the semen part um, of the uh, uh, sperm added to it. And this is essentially going to be um, the liquid portion, the um, energy, the, the um, sugary part that's going to give the uh, sperm that extra bit of energy. They've expanded so much energy um, to get from here to here in the first place. They're going to need a refresher um, to get from here and then up inside the fallopian tubes and get through the eggs. Um, so the seminal vesicle is going to provide them with all that fluid that's going to have lots of sugars um, and stuff in to give them a, a nice extra boost. Um, it's also going to keep them from drying out. Um, once they leave um, this nice moist environment and travel inside of the, uh, um, hopefully, in, in the world of evolution, um, inside of the uh, their mate, inside of the female, to fertilize an egg. Well, anyway, um, once that occurs, um, it's going to travel through um, the ejaculatory duct, which is going to condense. Um, and uh, if, uh, so if, you can, if you've ever tensed your pelvic floor muscles up, you can tense this muscle up here if you're a mate. Um, and this forces uh, sperm to be pushed. Um, this is the muscle that you use to push uh, urine out as well, kind of thing. Um, and it pushes the uh, sperm out, forces the sperm out very quickly um, through the uh, process of ejaculation out through urethra um, and then th into um, the uh, environment to fertilize um, an egg. So your prostrate here go um, is going to um, kind of activate the sperm, kind of turn them on. 
um, once they're ready to leave. So they've kind of just been pushed through here at one point in time through the flow of water. They swim just a little bit, not very much. Um, and then once they hit the prostate gland that sits right here, um, they travel through the vas deferens. They get their fluid added here that's got all that sugar um, that they need to be powered with. The prostate gland is going to turn them on. Um, the prostate gland is going to go, you were exhausted from swimming through here, you got a refresher, and now it's time to go again. Here you go, you got some rest, you got a refresher, let's go again. Boom, you're turned on, prostate gland is going to turn them on and tell them to, now it's time to really swim. Now it's time to do your thing. This is not a game anymore. This is not practice. It's for real. Game time. And the prostate gland is going to cause them um, to become active, to become fully functional uh, sperm that are capable of swimming the distance um, to fertilize the egg. So um, ejaculation is the process of actually discharging um, that sperm from the body. Now in males, um, the production of sperm is going to be uh, re re excuse me, regulated um, by the uh, production and turning off the production, both of those things, of hormones. So um, I'm going to post a video to um, go over this a little bit as well, but essentially how this works. Um, in your testes, if sperm count is low, um, you've recently ejaculated, um, and you need to re uh, have more sperm, um, what's going to happen is your body's going to detect a low sperm count, not a lot of sperm. It's going to trigger your brain to release um, a hormone called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which stimulates the testes to produce more sperm. Now, once the sperm count goes up, the body um, detects that the sperm has been replenished, and then it will turn off the production of gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which turns off the production of sperm in the testes. Then they'll hang out waiting to be, uh, to be ejaculated again. Once the sperm count drops low, uh, the brain body will recognize that, triggering the brain to uh, tell the pituitary to release more gonadotropin-releasing hormone, which then tells the testes to produce sperm, and sperm is produced. So it's a, a positive and negative feedback loop. Positive to produce, this, uh, turn this, uh, um, to produce the sperm, and then negative to turn it off. So um, this is a little more complex than this. If you'd like to get into the follicle-stimulating hormone and uh, luteinizing hormone here, um, please feel free to check out the uh, um, extra supplementary videos um, that are attached as well. So let's go ahead and talk about the egg production um, in females. Now in a female, um, females are born with all of the eggs that they will ever have um, throughout their lifetime. Um, all of your eggs are produced via meiosis, um, prior to being born, they're produced um, in utero, and they, you are born with them. Now, there's a small amount of evidence that uh, you can stimulate the production of eggs later in life, um, but it takes uh, hormones to do that. Um, it does happen rarely uh, naturally, though. Uh, but most women, for the most part, are going to be born with all the eggs they will ever have um, throughout their life stored in their ovaries. Um, those eggs are going to be essentially dormant. They're frozen in time. They're kind of just sleeping um, until a woman hits puberty. Um, and then the eggs will become active. They will be released once a month um, throughout the process of menstruation, which we'll talk about in just a second as well. Now, essentially, your ovary um, is a sack, uh, uh, um, a case of eggs, a big carton of eggs. And inside of all those carton of eggs are little tiny sleeping egg cells. Um, once a month, one of those little cartons will be opened. Um, one egg will be released from the carton, and it will travel down the uterine tubes here. You probably have heard these referred to as the fallopian tubes or the horns of the uterus. Um, it will travel down um, the fallopian tube. Um, if it becomes fertilized, it will eventually implant itself here in the uterus. And we'll talk about this process a little more in depth in just a second. So, um, down here, okay. So here's how this works. Inside of your ovaries, you, at one point in time, have little tiny germ cells that are ready to produce your eggs. Your eggs um, are ready to be produced when you hit um, puberty. Once you hit puberty, um, those germ cells become active. They divide one time to become a uh, uh, an egg cell, essentially. It's a little more complicated process than this, but they form a, a, a something called a follicle. And inside of that follicle um, contains an egg. You can see that here. Now, 
um, this process is a little more complicated than this. You form something called polar bodies. So, so um, if you know, uh, if you recall from sperm, you get four sperm. Same process here, um, except you get one egg and three polar bodies, three little non-functional eggs. Um, this has to do with the fact that eggs are really big. You need a lot of information, a lot of mitochondria, a lot of DNA and things to build a baby. Um, so you have three little useless cells um, that are going to be uh, gotten rid of at some point in time. You can see them here, the little polar bodies. Um, and then one cell that eventually will become the egg. So anyway, um, all your dormant egg cells are stored inside of your ovaries. Um, you hit puberty. Um, and then these little dormant cells become active. They divide. Um, into a primary oocyte, primary egg, um, and then what's going to happen is those that polar body is going to divide one more time, or you're going to have the cell divide one more time to per, uh, form an egg and a polar body here. So then what's going to happen um, is then when you're, so you're ready to ovulate in the middle of the month, um, that follicle will uh, be stimulated by a follicle-stimulating hormone um, to be opened up and release the egg that it stores inside. That egg will then be released from inside of the ovary into the fallopian tube or the uterine tube. Um, it will travel down the uterine tube, um, out through the uterine tube, out through the uterus, um, out through, and then essentially it will travel through the um, uh, through the uh, um, uh, womb and then down through the cervix um, and then be passed through uh, just regular day-to-day uh, -day life. You just pass it that way um, if you do not become pregnant. Now, if you do become pregnant, um, there is sperm that is uh, inserted in through the birth canal. It can swim up through the cervix. Um, it will unite with the egg inside of the fallopian tube. Um, if this process occurs, fertilization usually will occur, and then this egg will travel its path down um, through the fallopian tube and eventually implant itself inside of the uterus. Now you can see up here we have the follicle cells, which have the little egg inside. You can see them down here. Um, and this is where the little egg is going to be released from, uh, right there, the little egg is going to be released from its little cup. Okay. So here's egg development. Um, a little easy, so you get your germ cell, you're born with this one. Um, you, these are used one time. Once this is gone, um, it, you don't get any more of these. So mi uh, guys can produce sperm throughout their entire life. Females have a certain number of eggs that they can get, and that's it. Um, so kind of a slight un, uh, disadvantage, um, slight unfair uh, on that one. Uh, anyway, um, so you get one cell that divides into two. That one cell, or those two cells are going, now we're going to follow one, so keep in mind there's another one up here. Um, that one cell is going to divide into two. Um, one polar body, one useless cell, um, and that's because you need a really big cell um, that has all the DNA, all the mitochondria to form a, uh, uh, an embryo. That one cell will travel down the fallopian tubes. Um, if it is fertilized, um, it will continue on with its development. If it's not fertilized, it just uh, is passed throughout the body. Um, that one polar body will divide again into two more polar bodies that are useless. So useless little cells, the polar bodies, um, and that's just because you need a big giant egg cell that has lots and lots and lots of stuff inside of it um, to make sure that you have enough DNA and enough uh, cytoplasm and enough mitochondria um, to build and power um, a new developing organism. So anyway, um, once that egg is, leaves the uh, ovary, travels down the uterine tubes or the fallopian tubes here, um, if it's fertilized, it will eventually implant itself inside of the uterus. Now, um, what's going on here? So let's talk about that. So you can see here our ovary. Um, our ovary is going to essentially release the egg um, during the process of ovulation. Now in an average female, this usually takes, in, let's pretend this is a month long period. Um, this usually occurs about two weeks after the beginning of the month. Um, so period, the menstruation would occur at the end of the month. Um, and then the two weeks after the end of menstruation, um, ovulation usually occurs, and then two weeks after ovulation, menstruation usually begins. And this is the stereotypical um, walkthrough of how this usually works. So anyway, um, the ovary will release the egg. Um, the egg, as it will travel through the uh, fallopian tubes, um, will eventually become fertilized along the way. Once it becomes fertilized, it will start to divide um, initial division um, very, very, very early um, on and it takes place inside the fallopian tube. 
as the uh, cell continue, the egg develops, uh, the zygote at this point in time, um, is traveling down the fallopian tubes, uh, more and more cell division will occur. Um, eventually what's going to happen it was it will enter into the uterus. That's what the eventual game. This is the uh, nursery um, where the baby will grow, um, where the zygote will grow and develop. So usually about seven days or so after the point of fertilization, um, implantation takes place um, of the egg um, to the sidewall of the uterus. Now once the egg implants inside of the uterus, um, this is going to allow blood vessels to grow. Um, the placenta will, will form here. Um, and this is going to allow blood vessels to form from the mother's body into the developing offspring, the developing baby's body. Um, she can feed nutrients through that uh, blood vessel, oxygen exchange, waste exchange through that. Um, and that's where the baby is going to develop the placenta um, and going to attach to, via the umbilical cord eventually. Um, and that's where the uh, placenta will form, right where that uh, baby implants, or right where the, uh, the um, blastocyst implants. So anyway, um, um, once this occurs, um, this, if you, uh, once this implantation occurs, your body will undergo a, a hormone change. Um, it recognizes that an implantation has occurred, um, and it causes a hormone change, which stops the releasing of more ovaries, um, of more eggs from the ovary. It stops the ovary from releasing more eggs. Um, if implantation does not occur, um, the ovaries do not get the signal to stop releasing eggs, and then they will release another egg the next month in preparation um, of becoming pregnant again, and that's how that works. Um, same concept here. Um, in females um, for releasing eggs and producing um, and, and, and uh, menstruation. So um, you produce, um, you, you get ready for an egg, you produce progesterone, which causes the gonadotropin releasing hormone to stimulate the follicle stimulating hormone, which stimulates the ovary to release an egg, which releases an egg, it travels down, it's not attached, which causes the um, levels to go down, which then the body releases, it's not there, which causes the body to go up again, and so on and so forth. It's just steps, very methodical steps um, of how this one's regulated um, on the uh, production of eggs and hormones, and releasing of eggs, I should say. Now, how does this work um, in the sense of period? So here's what's going on here. Um, so what happens um, to your, um, to the, why does a period occur and things like this? So um, when your body is going to become pregnant, when it needs to become uh, pregnant, or when it thinks it needs to become pregnant, I should say, um, it's going to get ready for a baby to come into the world um, and get ready to support that baby. So the human body, the female body, um, has evolved to build a nursery essentially once a month um, to carry a baby. And it builds its, its over, uh, nursery inside of the uterus. So essentially what happens is a once the um, uh, menstruation occurs, um, two weeks later, um, you will release another egg. Now during that two-week period, the body's going to build a nursery. It's going to start preparing the walls of the uterus, building them up with lots of blood vessels, getting them ready for the implantation of an egg to occur, um, building the nursery inside of the uterus. Now what's going to happen? Um, at the same time as the egg is going to become mature, um, it's essentially then going to be released at the exact same time. And this is controlled by hormones. Both of these hormones, um, estrogen and progesterone, um, regulate this. The more estrogen, the eggs will be released. The more progesterone um, maintains pregnancy. Um, so interesting how this works. I'll talk a little bit more about these trade-offs here in just a second. So what occurs? Um, once ovulation takes place at the heat of the progesterone, uh, sorry, at the peak of, or da once the downhill of the estrogen starts to occur, ovulation will occur. Um, so, uh, ovulation occurs, the egg is released. If it is fertilized, it will implant itself inside of the uterus. Um, it plants somewhere along the way of the uterus, blood vessels occur, and the progesterone levels, since the body has become pregnant, realizes that and it stays stable. Nothing ever changes. The uterus never sloughs off. The uh, hormone level stays the same. Estrogen will drop, causing no more eggs to be released. Now, if you do not become pregnant, um, if the egg is not fertilized, what will occur is the progesterone levels 
um, which are meant to keep the baby implanted inside the uterus. There is no implantation of the uterus, um, or embryo inside the uterus. The progesterone levels will drop. No implantation, no progesterone. The progesterone levels drop. And then when progesterone levels drop, estrogen starts to go up again. Um, and then when the estrogen levels start to go up again, it causes the uterus to go, oh man, my baby didn't show up. I didn't get another show up. I didn't, I, I want a baby, man, I want a baby. So it throws a fit, um, it tears up the entire nursery, and that's period. Um, and then the next couple of weeks, it goes, oh man, I really want a baby, and it builds a new nursery. Um, and then once it realizes it's not getting a baby, it throws a fit, um, and then it has to build a new nursery. Now this is how um, periods and menstruation work. They're controlled solely by hormones. Um, the flow of estrogen and progesterone within your body um, regulate the schleffing off of the uterine wall um, to refresh it for the next month to uh, in preparation um, of becoming pregnant. So here's the words of what I just talked through. Now you can regulate all this stuff. You can stop this um, with birth control. So birth control essentially um, messes up the hormone cycle. Um, you can freak out the progesterone and the estrogen levels by artificially adding it in. Um, so if you artificially add in progesterone, your body permanently thinks it's pregnant, so therefore it won't ever release an egg. Or if you, um, it, it's interesting how this works, or if you have uh, different levels of estrogen, your body thinks it's pregnant, so it won't release eggs. Um, and things like that, or you can uh, manipulate the, uh, the levels where you won't have periods, no menstruation, and things like that. Very interesting what you can do by manipulating these types of hormones. Um, but essentially, birth control is going to work in one of three main ways. Um, so if you use birth control, um, or your partner does, you probably need to be aware of how these work, um, of how their particular birth control works, so you can uh, be aware of that um, and take precautions. So the three ways that birth control work. Um, is birth control is going to work by preventing ovulation to occur in the first place. Um, this is going to mess with the hormones um, here. If you mess with the hormone level and you can prevent this process of eggs being released, no eggs are ever going to be released, um, you can prevent an egg from traveling down the fallopian tube and getting pregnant even if sperm is there. If there's sperm in place and no egg, no fertilization can occur. So preventing the um, releasing of eggs is one way um, that birth control works. Another way that birth control can work is it can change the conditions inside of the, the um, birth canal, the vag vaginal canal, um, to make it hostile for sperm to survive in. Um, it can make it very acidic. Um, it can cause a hormone change inside the female's body, which causes the conditions inside the uh, uh, vaginal canal to change and things like that, um, which can cause the sperm to have difficulty surviving. Um, and then the other way that sperm, um, that birth control can work is it can prevent sperm from traveling um, up the fallopian tubes in the first place. Um, if you know anything about female anatomy in the cervix, there's a little small hole um, that sperm will travel through, and uh, that's called a moist, uh, mucus plug. Um, birth control can work by thickening that mucus plug, um, making it hard for sperm to swim through. Um, combination birth controls do uh, one of or more or two or more of those three, um, if not all three. Um, so if you're on a birth control that doesn't necessarily stop ovulation, um, eggs can still be released. So it's possible to still become pregnant, um, even though you might be taking a birth control. So it's very important to know how your birth control works um, if you plan to take it and use it. Um, as a primary means of uh, preventing pregnancy. So there are other ways to assist in birth control as well, other than contraception. Um, there are physical means of birth control. Um, abstinence is the most obvious one. If you don't have sex for the most part, you're probably not going to get pregnant. Um, advantages and disadvantages of that one, things like that. Um, you can read all of these here for different ways of doing this different types of contraception, things like condoms, withdrawal method, vasectomy. So a vasectomy, you're going to physically cut the vas deferens or tie a knot in it um, to prevent sperm from being able to travel through, um, things like that. Um, you can do a, a same in females. You can cut the um, fallopian tubes, uh, get your tube type of tubal, tubal ligation, um, and things like that. The, these are usually almost not, if always, um, irreversible. You can't fix these once they um, happen. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to reverse them. So if you want one of these, make sure you really know what you want um, and things like that. 
Um, so um, there are other ways to do this, IUDs that prevent sperm from being able to travel into the cervix in the first place, um, low hormones, all kinds of different ways um, to prevent birth control. Uh, or sorry, to prevent an uh, unwanted pregnancy. So um, if you're interested in this, take a look at these, the advantages and disadvantages of this. Make sure you know what they are. Um, it's very easy to prevent pregnancies in most circumstances. It's not always um, preventable. So um, even if you are using birth control in the 100% um, recommended way that you do, um, that by the, the label that it says on the package, it is still possible um, to become pregnant. And many people do. Every year, you can see the numbers here, um, out of 100 women, many people still do become pregnant, even using condoms. Um, every single year, about 15 people out of 100 will become pregnant, even with condoms. Um, they break and things like that. So um, this start tries to be very honest about it. Um, so um, if you're curious about that, go ahead and take a look at it. So um, another cost of human reproduction are STDs. <clears throat> STDs, sexually transmitted diseases, the better way of putting this are STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Um, these are going to be diseases that are spread um, or infections that are spread from host to host, primarily during sexually, uh, sexual encounters. You can uh, get um, HIV and things through blood transfusions or through combination or through birth. Um, you can get HPV from um, contact through open skin by shaking hands with someone. You can get um, herpes from kissing and things like that. There are other ways to get um, different types of these um, infections, but the primary route of, in of infection, the way that they uh, are meant to spread, the primary way that they spread around are through um, sexually transmitted uh, means uh, from host to host. Now, this is a very, very useful strategy uh, for bacteria and different types of microbes to transmit. Um, every organism on the planet pretty much has sex all the time, or likes to have sex for the most part. And sex is a very easy way to bypass most of the body's defenses. Um, it's very hard to get inside of an organism. You're covered in skin. Um, it's kind of hard to burrow through that. But if you can hitch a ride on something that's already going inside of the other organism, or inside of that organism in the first place, it's very easy to get past those defenses. So sex is a very easy way to... Um, infect another organism. Um, so lots of microbes have evolved to take advantage of STDs, uh, of sex as, a, as their method of uh, reproduction. So um, once again, um, those contraceptions will come very in handy um, to protect from STDs for the most part. Not always. Um, they have their advantages and advantages again um, to prevent them. Um, you can see over here some of the different common ones, um, some of the ways that they're treated. Now keep in mind, a lot of these guys are becoming very difficult to treat. Um, as antibiotics become less and less useful due to bacterial resistance. Um, in the uh, UK, gonorrhea is essentially um, drug resistant. You essentially, you will pretty much die with gonorrhea. It won't kill you, um, but you, you, they can't get rid of it. Um, there's not a whole lot they can do to help you. Um, if your body just doesn't shed it, you're essentially going to have it for the rest of your life. Um, so once fertilization occurs, lots of different things are going to occur. Um, so. Um, once fertilization occurs, your um, sorry, or prior to that, I should say, we've talked about this one a lot. The egg's gonna trap be released. Um, sperm's going to swim up the fallopian tubes. The sperm's going to come in contact with the egg. Now, what's going to happen after that occurs? The sperm is going to come in contact with the egg. The anachrosome, the uh, little hard uh, cap, is going to dissolve, um, and that's going to dissolve that when you release a bunch of enzymes. Um, which will help break down the coating around the egg. Um, the sperm will then swim its way through um, the egg, um, through the uh, spidoplasm, through the egg's coating, inside the eggs, and physically inside the egg cell now. Um, the egg has a haploid nucleus. The sperm has a haploid nucleus. And then once those two haploid nucleuses come in contact with one another, um, a, they will fuse and then the process of fertilization has occurred. Those two haploids become one diploid nucleus, um, and now the zygote has formed, diploid um, from haploid. Once you have a haploid nucleus, you now have a zygote, one single cell, that will become a new organism. Now, um, once this egg cell has been penetrated by, so thousands of sperm cells will arrive at this egg at one point in time. Um, 
one of them will be able to penetrate through faster than the other. And the second that that one cell unites with and uh, with that zy with that nucleus here, um, with the egg nucleus, um, the egg shuts off that uh, process of letting more sperm cells through. Once one's in, it's all over for the rest of them. Only one's going to get through. Um, the rest of them instantaneously are shut off from being able to penetrate through the outside. Um, now, you often heard that um, it's the fastest sperm the, uh, that wins the race, and that's not necessarily true. Um, there is a, a little bit of evidence, a, a decent amount of evidence actually, to support um, that eggs can choose selectively based on some sort of trait that they sort of like hormone, hormonally speaking, um, or sugars, whatever, some sort of thing on the sperm. Um, which one happens to be the healthiest one that's arrived at the time, um, which is kind of interesting. So uh, slight evolutionary benefit to being able to do that. So it's not just necessarily the most random sperm that arrived there, the fastest or whatever. Um, there's a slight bit of picking um, by the egg cell, which is kind of cool. So we've talked about this as well. Um, once that fertilization occurs, um, division from that cell starts to occur, that zygote starts to divide um, and differentiate out into different um, parts of the body of that new organism. Okay, um, so what's going to occur is once that zygote has implanted itself inside of the uterine wall, um, blood vessels from the mother are going to start to grow from her body into the um, blastocyst, the little um, zygote that has embedded itself inside of her uterine wall. Um, so it's going to start to grow um, inside of there, you can see it here, um, and invade her body. Uh, or her body, sorry, is going to start to, uh, the, the capillaries are going to invade um, the little growing zygote here, the little blastocyst. Um, this is how oxygen exchange is going to occur, nutrient exchange, and things like that. Um, as this process continues, um, you can see here that the zygote and started to grow um, and grow a little larger. It started to push farther inside the uterus. The uterus has started to grow around um, as well as it continues on. You can see here it's starting to grow in. Um, and then eventually, um, two or three weeks later, what will happen is the uterus will fully engulf um, the developing embryo. It will fully engulf it. You can see here the... Um, uh, sorry, the uh, capillaries have spread all around here. The blood vessels, they've totally gotten around um, the zygote. They're totally surrounding all of it uh, with nutrient exchange and oxygen exchange and things like that. Um, and you can see the placenta is starting to form around um, our zygote here as well. It's a very interesting little formation here. Um, you can see inside of our embryo here, we have our endoderm, which will eventually become the internal organs of the developing embryo here, the mesoderm, which is going to eventually become your in, um, lining of your internal organs and things like that, and then your ectoderm, which is essentially going to become your skin. So very interesting uh, form of development. Okay, so you can see here what's going to happen um, is as this continues, essentially what's going to happen is your egg is, cell is going to continue to grow in the middle um, the placenta will grow and start to innervate more and more. Um, the umbilical cord will form from that cell as it kind of pinches itself in, um, forms more and more space in the middle. It pinches and pinches and grows larger and larger and larger. Um, more and more and more of the blood vessels from the mother will innervate, innervate the placenta. Um, the baby will have uh, umbilical cord that stretches out from his body or their body from the um, navel um, that eventually will connect from the blood vessels to the mother um, into the blood vessels of the uh, developing embryo. It, uh, and that's where nutrient exchange and oxygen and stuff is now going to be directly exchanged. Okay, so um, about um, three weeks or so in, um, you're going to start just to see development of the uh, brain um, very primitive development of the brain, very primitive development of um, genitals and things um, in the embryo. Very, very, very primitive, um, non-functional yet. In about 3.5 weeks, you can start to see a very primitive heart develop in a, in a, a, a human fetus. Um, these are going to be eventually become the parts of the internal ears here. Your umbilical cord starts to form. About four weeks, you can see the ears here, what will eventually become the brain, a very primitive eye, very primitive heart, um, and things like that. You can start to see them form 
um, in a human embryo. Okay, so um, the primitive streak um, essentially will give rise to your backbone, and you can kind of see that here. Um, you can see the backbone in these in this uh, picture down here a little better right there as well. Um, but you can see it pretty easy. It runs right up through the middle um, of the body, and that essentially will become the backbone or the notochord in some organisms. Um, we'll talk about notochords a little later on um, when we get to the uh, section over chordates. Okay. Now, um, once uh, a baby hits about six weeks or so, um, if you have an X chromosome or a Y chromosome, um, they will now become activated. Um, if you recall um, from Biology 1, um, Y chromosomes carry very little useful information other than the SRY or the TDF gene, just used determining factor. Um, and that's about the only thing that's on the Y chromosome. And it tells the body to develop testicles um, instead of uh, the developing a uh, vagina. So up until about week six, the chromosomes, the X and Y chromosomes, are not on, um, which means we have essentially an undifferentiated uh, genital um, in, a, in a developing embryo. Um, it doesn't have anything going on. And you can kind of see it looks a little bit like both uh, male and female genitals here. Now, about nine weeks or so, about seven weeks, uh, about nine weeks you can start to see what's going on. Um, but about seven weeks or so, the Y chromosome will become activated. Um, if it becomes activated, if you have one, um, testosterone will start to be produced, which will differentiate um, this little primitive uh, non-genital uh, structure into a developing uh, penis. You can start to see here. Um, you can see all the different types of tissues. They stay the same and what they, di what they differentiate out into. Um, you can see the head of the penis start to grow. The urethra in the middle is going to form the anus. Um, and then you can start to see um, as the uh, male uh, baby continues to develop about 14 weeks, you can see a fully formed uh, penis and you can see the actual tissues from which it developed from. Now, if you have a two Y chromosomes, there is no, y, uh, sorry, two X chromosomes, there is no Y to become active. Um, the te testosterone is not produced. Um, you will develop the default X pattern um, to develop a vagina. Um, you can see the different patterns down here, the different types of tissues. They look very similar, and they're in the same locations, and they will develop into the same things. Um, but the anatomy and the location eventually will become different. But it's the same tissues um, that are just used to develop different, um, different uh, things um, on the body. But they do the same kind of idea. Um, so essentially, um, we all start out as default um, X chromosomes, and if you have a Y chromosome, it turns on about week seven. If you don't, you just to follow um, the default X chromosome that everyone had to start with. Okay. So birth is a, is a three-step process. Um, once you are fully developed, your body is ready to leave your mother's uh, body and enter into the world. Um, what's going to happen is a perfect example of positive feedback. The baby will become so large um, that it will break the amniotic sac. Now, the amniotic sac, um, I'll talk about this a little later on when we get to animals um, and the concept of eggs and things like that um, and leaving the water, um, but it's essentially a little tiny, um, it's essentially a human egg. Um, it's a, it's a, a little tiny development pool um, for a human baby inside of the, the mother. Um, it, it's evolutionarily speaking, if you live in the water like a fish, things that do external fertilization, everybody needs to have moisture to develop. You're going to, they're going to have to have a wet environment that you have a baby in, um, or you're going to have to take the wet environment with you. Um, so every organism has developed their own strategy to do that. Um, birds have eggs, reptiles have eggs, their own little wet environment. We carry ours inside of us. Some of the uh, things that fish have eggs um, in the water themselves. So anyway, oh, the amniotic sac is essentially our little pond for babies to grow in. Well, anyway, um, once the baby gets large enough, it pops its little water balloon. Um, and when the water balloon pops, that is the triggering for the baby to be born. Once the body senses that that little water balloon pops, um, it's going to process that as, oh, snap. Um, I need to secrete hormones that need to get this baby out. It's ready to be released. I don't want to kill it. I need to get it out. So once that's going to occur, um, the baby's head is going to press against the cervix. You can see the cervix here. And once that occurs, the body's going to realize that the baby's head's pressing against the cervix. 
um, and it's going to re uh, secrete uh, hormones. Those hormones are going to cause the uterus to contract, which is going to squeeze the baby and push him into the cervix. That's a contraction. The squeezing of the uterus, pushing him into the cervix. That's caused by hormones. Once he's squeezed and pushed into the cervix, the harder he pushes, the more hormone is released. The more hormone that's released, the harder the uterus squeezes, the harder the baby pushes into the cervix. The harder he pushes, the more hormone, the more squeezing, the harder he pushes, the more hormone, the harder the squeeze. And it's a building up process. It's positive uh, feedback, building up on one top of its, uh, itself, uh, making the contraction stronger and stronger and stronger until eventually the baby is expelled uh, from the body. It's pushed out um, and the baby is born. Now, once the baby is pushed out, the placenta um, that's been attached to the inside of the uterine wall um, to via the umbilical cord to the baby will quickly follow behind the baby. So the uh, uterine cord, that's uh, the umbilical cord that's attached to the baby will come with the baby. You generally will then cut the umbilical cord um, and then the pull it out or it comes out with the baby attached sometimes. Um, but the placenta will then be pushed out very quickly um, from the mother's body afterwards. Sometimes you have to remove it. It doesn't always shed. Um, after the baby is born, this placenta is essentially just dead flesh. Um, if it stayed inside the mother, it would cause infection and sepsis and things like that. Um, so it's pulled out and removed at the same time um, to allow for the uterus to then refresh itself and build a new uh, nursery inside for another baby to essentially uh, be uh, implanted um, in a couple of weeks' time. So birth defects. Um, about 3% of newborns in the United States um, will be develop, uh, born with some sort of birth defect that results in a disability. I mean, you can see here, um, most of these developmental issues will occur um, after um, the baby has reached about two months of age. Um, most of the defects for internal organs, you can see that here, um, are going to occur during the developmental time when the body is laying out its structures. Um, the rest of the defects, things like central nervous system, um, reproductive system, central nervous system being brain, um, nerves, and things like that, they can be influenced by how much oxygen you get if your mother smokes or drinks um, or does drugs of some sort and things like that, um, if, you, if uh, she gets in an accident um, or uh, things like that, um, can be damaging to the baby as well, um, even after the baby has been developed, even while, while it's growing. Things that would hurt you in, in normal day-to-day uh, -day after birth life kind of thing um, can hurt a fetus as well after it's born. But you can't go back and cause your heart to have a hole growing in it um, after your heart has been formed kind of concept here. Um, so anyway, um, teratogens um, are uh, uh, things that cause birth defects. Um, and there are quite a few of them. Um, even in low uh, concentrations, if a mother that's pregnant comes in contact with some of these things, um, it can cause defects to occur um, inside of her baby. I mean, you can see down here um, the age um, of what, uh, the, the after development here, after uh, zygote development, um, the age of the embryo and what it's most sensitive to those different types of teratogens and things like that. Um, so chemicals and metals, you're probably familiar with lots of chemicals, lead, zinc, things that can cause um, birth defects. Alcohol, for sure, um, dries out cells, deprives them of oxygen and nutrients. Cigarettes um, deprives the cells of oxygen, illicit drugs, deprives them of nutrients and things like that. All of these things um, can cause different types of birth defects by depriving these developing cells um, of crucial uh, nutrients, crucial oxygen, and things that they need. Um, or causing the cells to not develop properly um, during those time periods. So if they don't develop properly, um, the resulting baby, the resulting uh, embryo will have uh, problems as well. So um, I've talked a little bit about contraception and things like that. Um, contraception is the deliberate prevention of pregnancy. Um, I've talked a little bit about wearing condoms and things like that, vas uh, vasectomies, tubal ligation, things like that. Um, and then you can go... Um, with the um, even more hardcore form um, of abortion of terminating a pregnancy. Now, most people don't think about this, and most people are unaware, um, that spontaneous abortion is a thing that occurs very often in females. Um, most sexually active females have been pregnant at some point in their life. Um, they may just not know it yet. 
about one in three pregnancies is spontaneously aborted um, before the body even recognizes it's pregnant. Um, usually within about a week or so after um, the fertilization occurs, the body doesn't recognize it's pregnant yet, um, but the um, zygote may have a problem um, or it may not implant properly, um, and it's just terminated and it's passed through the body um, without even the mother even knowing it. Um, so that's a very common thing. Spontaneous abortion occurs very often and very naturally. Um, that's the same term as a miscarriage, by the way, um, in sexually active uh, females. And that's pretty much all I've got for you guys um, over the reproduction in, in animals, um, production of sperm, production of eggs, and things like that. Um, so if you guys have any questions at all over this, feel free to send me an email. Um, if not, have a good rest of the day.